Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. So, Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, we're grateful that you are the one who is going to teach us tonight your word so that we can be what you would have us to be, Lord, because we know you have our best interest at hand and in heart. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Bless all the churches in the inland empire around the world that are preaching the gospel tonight. God, there are brothers and our sisters. We don't want you to just bless us. We want you to bless them also. Wherever they're at, there are brothers and sisters. We love them. Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Catholic, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary chapels, whatever, God, doesn't matter. There are brothers and sisters, and we don't care what they say about us. We say we love them, and we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Everybody say a big amen. amen. It's going to be good. Well, I, I've got my coffee. <laughs> they actually brought me coffee this time. I mean, they're, they're wild. I got to see if it's right. Oh, lukewarm motor oil. <laughs> Left over from the day. <laughs> Hey, listen, real quick, I just want to share something with you. I want you to listen to me just for a moment. I've said this uh, probably a hundred times. A lot of times there's new people that haven't heard this. You know, you should have been taught the word of God by your mother and by your father. You should have been taught. And it's a tragedy that many of you weren't. Many of you have been taught that. Well, I'm not your mother and I'm not your father but I am your grandpa. And grandpa wants to share something with you. Now most of you never had a grandparent ever teach you anything about God. I'm gonna be 70 years old in a couple of months. Mama's gonna be 22. <laughs> oh, that's how many grandchildren we have. And uh, well, it's what it sounds like when they're in my house. But I just want you to know that if you'll listen tonight, there's something special God wants to say for you. It's not just something, you know, that I thought of or anything like that. This is something that I really have a mandate from God to share with you tonight. Look, it's important that you understand something before we get into what God says, the Bible. What you need to understand, what I always need to understand is that God really cares about me. There's some of you that came to church tonight for whatever reasons, maybe somebody brought you. Maybe you're down or discouraged, or maybe you're frustrated, maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're saying, I'm not here, really, I don't wanna be here, I'm just here. They brought me and I don't care to be here. But whatever reason that you're here, you gotta know something. Listen to what I'm gonna say to you. God really loves you and really wants to bless your life, and it's not too late. The whole thing about the Bible, now listen, I've been a theologian for 37 years. The whole thing about the Bible is this, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's not just to prove who God is, but to prove what God's will is for you and I. Why? Because he wants to take his people, fight for them, bless them, bring them into an amazing relationship with him, that would be a lot, people that would be lost and dying, going to hell would see you prospering in every area of your life and say, oh my goodness, what have you got? And you become the greatest witness for the Lord because God has simply blessed you. My friends, listen to what the word of God has to say from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. When you learn how to get rid of yourself, your own philosophies and ideas and start to adapt to what the Bible says with your home, family, children, finances, dreams, vision, all of a sudden you start to get literally blessed. The favor of God goes before you. Doors that you couldn't open, open. Business activities take place. Prosperity from every area of your life starts to work for you. All because you adapt your life to what God says. And you put that first before your own feelings. When you put his word first before your own feelings in every area of your life, you're going to get healed. Now tonight I want to share something with you. I, I kind of don't like the title. Let's pop up the title. It's real attitude, a real Christian attitude. It really should be how to maintain 
a real Christian attitude. The very thing that God paid for is you to be blessed so that he could be part of his family, really loves his kids, really wants to fight for his kids. He, you know, the, the proof of that is you and your kids. You really want them to be blessed. You really want them to prosper. You really want them to be happy. You really want them to be fulfilled. You really want them to, to live life and just have everything, even the things that you don't have. You would give it up for them. It's not what Jesus did for us. He gave it up for us so that we could be blessed in every area. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, like I said last time we were together, that God did not put Adam and Eve in a trash dump. He put them in the most beautiful place they could possibly be, created by God, the garden itself, where they needed absolutely nothing. And they were such fools that they chose to do something different than what God told them to do and ended up failing. And that's what we do all the time. We end up choosing to do our own thing instead of God's thing, end up failing, wondering where God is, why God doesn't come along. And all we have to do is get the picture. This is God's plan, who knows what's best for us. If we appropriate it in our life, we enter into the promised land of our own lives. And each one of you have your own promised land. An attitude has a lot to say about your stability has a lot to say about what you really believe and what you really don't believe. Let me give you an illustration. If I'm believing God for good things, but I go around as a crabby old man, I go around down and negative and depressed in my life and frustrated over everything, I'm never going to get anywhere. I can't even, listen to this, I can't even get my faith going when I'm down, depressed, and discouraged. I've got to get back on an attitude that is a godly attitude that's up and excited and alive for the future. Listen, I can fall and fail and make mistakes today, but my God will pick me up. You know, the word of God says it like this. Listen to what the word of God says. He says, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Even if I fall or make a mistake, he'll pick me up, put me on the right path. If my heart is right with him, I cannot miss until I make my own decisions on how to do life. And many of you haven't really entered into the promised land of your life or the blessings that God has for you. You know why? Because you've missed it. You've done your own thing instead of God's thing. And you've done it your own way. And in order for you to do it God's way, you've got to have the right kind of attitude. There's no way in the world I can have faith in God and be a crab. No way. It doesn't work. Proof of that is the children in the promised land. They're headed to the promised land. What did they do? They grumbled all the time. God calls it what word? Murmuring. Murmur, murmur. You know what murmur is? Underneath their breath. Talking about, well, I don't know. The blessing that I'm supposed to be walking in. God, I don't see any blessing there. I don't think God can do anything. What in the heck am I doing here in the desert? Well, this is awful. Who the heck knows who's this Moses guy? This Moses guy comes along and all of us, he's got a spellbound. Why are we even here at this place? We ought to go back and eat the leeks. We're better off on that side with Pharaoh. Why do we have anything to do with this guy? Man, let's take him out and string him up. I don't know. I don't know about you. Man, they got a bad attitude. Am I right or am I right? They got a bad attitude and they're expecting God to bless them. Can I tell you what God did with those people with a bad attitude? Here's what God does. He lets them live, but they die. And he doesn't give them the promised land until someone comes along with a better attitude. That tells me a lot about myself. I mean, when I was sick, you think I said to God, God, what are you doing? For 40 years, I've served you. I preached the gospel around the world. One hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord. And I'm dying. I really thought I was dying. I never told Deborah that. I actually thought I was dying. For days at a time, I thought I was just living out that particular day just so that I could die the next day. And I'm complaining to God. Where are you? And finally, until I got off of myself and got on God, did God all of a sudden, bang, starts to heal me. Wasn't easy. I had to do what he told me to do. That wasn't easy for me. There was a lot of pain involved. Still is at times. But my friends, God has a future for you. But you'll never have the future until you have the right attitude. And with God, what other things should we be? Listen, the Bible says, you finish this verse. 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. If he can get my joy, he's got my strength. Listen, I say it again. The joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is my strength. Spiritual strength, physical strength, uh, future strength, ability strength. Joy of the Lord is my strength. If, he, if the devil or even my own thinking that's wrong can get my joy, he's got my strength. If he gets my strength, I will never get the promised land. Is anybody listening? Yeah. Whatever, you finish the verse. Whatever a man sows, he Whatever means whatever. Can I just say something to adults in here? If you sow crap, I know you never heard a preacher say that, right? Oh my goodness sakes, give me the white collar. Well, if you sow crap, guess what you get back? The Bible says everything produces after its own kind. If you put seed in the ground that's corn, you don't get an apple tree. If you put corn seed in, you get what? Corn. If you put junk in, you get junk. If you have a bad attitude, don't expect good things from God. It's all through the scripture. I'm going to share some verses with you tonight about people who amazingly had reasons for bad attitude, but maintain a good attitude. I'm going to take you to the beginning of the Bible, the Genesis 40th chapter. In Genesis, the 40th chapter, we're talking about a guy by the name of Joseph. Most of you know the story of Joseph. I know you know it probably better than anybody, but let's talk about Joseph for just a moment. He's a peculiar kid. He's married, uh, excuse me, he's uh, birthed by a very special woman that is in love with his dad. His dad is absolutely in love with Joseph's mom. But they have a lot of brothers, and some of the brothers were from other children. Uh, other, other wives, except me, excuse me, had other wives, and they were jealous of Joseph. The worst thing about Joseph is he is a guy that has a heart for the things of God, and God knows the very character of this man, Joseph, and God gives Joseph a dream. And the dream that God gives Joseph, listen to this, it says, your brothers will all bow down before you. Even your mother and father will bow down before you. Oh, when the brothers heard this, they just went off, say, that arrogant young little punk, who does he think he is? I can't stand that guy. And they murmured, had a bad attitude between each other. They take Joseph, they beat him up, throw him down in a well to die. They drag him out of the well, and then they sell him off to a caravan going to Egypt. We'll sell him as a slave, at least we'll get some money, and then we'll take his coat back to our dad, because he loves Joseph more than all of us, and we'll put sheep's blood all over the coat, and you know, that coat will represent that a lion got a hold of Joseph, and the dad wept, cried, and Joseph was off to Egypt. Joseph has to be a pretty special person. You know why I know Joseph had a great attitude? The Bible does not come out anywhere and say Joseph had a great attitude. What it says is something that you and I need to understand that Joseph, wherever he was, got promoted. Can I tell you something about people that have a bad attitude? Nobody wants to promote them. Nobody wants to give to them. Nobody wants to be around them. People, has anybody got any friend, anybody ever known, maybe a relative that you had somebody around in your life that, you know, had a bad attitude all the time, negative, depressed, discouraged, frustrated, complaining all the time. Let me tell you something. Very few people want to hang around someone like that, let alone promote them. Everywhere Joseph went, whether it was his first boss, Potiphar, who was head of the guard of Egypt, and he finds himself in a place where he, uh, he is exalted in the house of Potiphar, everything in Potiphar's house, a very rich man in Egypt, is under the control of Joseph. Isn't that wild? And then Potiphar's wife comes and hits on him. You know what that means, right? Does everybody know what that means? He, she's a hottie, and uh, uh, she comes and hits on him. Now, the Bible doesn't quite say it like that, but you get the drift. And uh, so she hits on him, and he makes a statement. I want to tell you what the statement is. It's such a statement of integrity. He said to her, he says, listen to this. He says, shall I sin against my God? Let me tell you something, girls. Let me just take a side note just for a moment. 
If you're dating somebody and he seems like the Mr. Perfect and he's calling himself a Christian and he wants to fool around before the marriage, no ring, no fling. Because you're, listen, listen, you're going to sin before your God and you're going to die and go to hell and someone needs to tell you that because that's called fornication and fornicators don't make it into the kingdom of God or an adulterous relationship is not going to be made in the kingdom of God. Don't let some man cause you to sin before your God. Stop it. You say, well, I don't know how to stop it. Then hang around here. It won't be long before you get the courage to stop it. But someone's got to tell you the truth. And so here's this guy with this massive amount of integrity. He's been, so Potiphar gets ticked off and throws him in prison. He's in prison for like a long time. Well, first of all, he's falsely accused by his brothers. He is thrown out of his, he's been stolen. He doesn't understand what the heck happened. He wakes up in Egypt. He's in the Potiphar's house. He's now in prison. Can you imagine what prison was like in those days in Egypt? Prison in Egypt must have been horrible. Can you imagine the size of the rats? I mean, they got rats in Egypt right now. I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about, you know, a thousand years ago. We're talking about a long time where the, they didn't have sanitation. You think they had toilets in the prison? They all had guards. You know, we're having a whoo, whistle break. Let's go lift weights for a little while. It ain't going to happen. This is an Egyptian prison. You're lucky to live, eat. You're lucky to even be existing. In the prison, he gets promoted. Now, that tells me he's got a good attitude. People like him. You know, some of the people you know that have a bad attitude, ain't nobody promoting them. In fact, you dread it when they call. Thank God for texting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, don't you? You don't have to deal with their personality today. <laughs> the greatest thing in the planet. I'm thinking of you. Goodbye. I don't want to talk to you for a week. You know what I'm talking about. You're laughing because you know. But it's so true, you know. So here he is, he's getting promoted. Then you find a situation that I wanted to share with you that I thought was fascinating in Genesis, the 40th chapter. Here he is in this place where he's about, now think about it like this. He's been in an Egyptian prison for years. I'm talking, I don't know, I don't think anybody really knows for sure, but probably somewhere between 10, 14 years. Falsely accused, falsely in prison, stolen off by, I mean, everything is wrong. If anybody has a reason for a bad attitude, don't you think it ought to be Joseph? Now, he meets these two guys. The Pharaoh of Egypt has a baker and has a butler. And somewhere along, the butler and baker screwed up and he throws them in prison, okay? Okay. And so here comes Joseph, he meets these guys, he says, man, I see your face, you're so sad, why are you sad? Joseph's talking to him. So they respond to Joseph, they said, well, first guy is, a, is a, a, ba a, a butler, and he says, well, I had a dream. And the dream frustrated me, and I don't know what the dream is. And, and Joseph says, tell me what the dream is. And he says, okay. He tells him what the dream is, and he gives him the interpretation, in three days you're going to get out and be restored back to, to, to the Pharaoh. And he says, okay. And the next guy watches us, the baker, and he says, hey, man, if you can do it for him, you can do it for me. So how, how, how about it? I had a dream, and here's what I dreamt. He says, but you're different. He says, in three days, you're going to not get out. They're going to take you out and hang you. And it becomes exactly like he says. He interprets the dream. And as they're being interpreted, listen to what Joseph says. Now let's go, if you will, into um, Genesis, the 40th chapter, verse 14. He says in verse 14, he says this, but remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. And also I have done nothing here that should be put me in this dungeon. And when the chief baker saw the interpretation was good, verse number 16, and said to Joseph, I also had a dream. He interprets that dream and tells the baker he's going to get hung. Let me jump you ahead a little bit to verse number, if you will, verse number 21 and verse number 
23. I, I'm not sure if I have verse 21 on the overhead, but I do have verse number 23. I'll read verse 21. And he restored the chief, chief bay, uh, butler and, uh, to butlership again, and he placed the cup of Pharaoh's hand. But he hung this chief baker as Joseph had uh, interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph. Now, wait a minute. That means nothing to you. But think about you're in prison. You're thinking, oh my goodness, here's an opportunity for me to get out. Here's an opportunity for somebody to speak to Pharaoh directly. God speaks to him, interprets the dreams exactly. The butler is reinstated into his position before the Pharaoh himself. And the, and the baker is hung. And he says, don't forget me. I'm in here for, unjustly. I need you to speak up for me to get me out. And this verse comes along and says this horrible expression. And yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Verse number one of chapter 41 says this. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years. Two more years. Do you think he had a reason to be depressed, down, discouraged, frustrated? He did something great and men let him down. How many of you have had people let you down from time to time? How many of people have promised you things that they have failed at? How many times have things not gone the way you thought they ought to go? How many times have you put an effort and a time into what you're doing and find that there's no results whatsoever? And it looks like man has let you down. You worked so hard to get to this place and all of a sudden now there's no hope. That's an amazing thing. When there's no hope from man, there's always God. Notice the verse. He says, for it came to pass that as the end of two years that Pharaoh had a drink. In other words, God had a different plan than Joseph's. Tonight, God has a different plan than yours. And you have got to maintain the right kind of godly attitude in order for you to get into the plan of God. And have you ever had a plan that you just knew this is, if you did this, 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 if you did this it'll all work out for you. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work out that way. And what is it? It's a personality crash. It's an attitude depression. It's something that'll rob your joy. It'll take your strength and rob the future. You'll never enter into the promised land. And all of a sudden, my friends, God had a different way. God said, well, I don't need the butler. I'm going to speak to Pharaoh himself and cause such a confusion. I'm going to give him a couple of dreams that are wind him up like a clock and he'll search and not find anybody to interpret the dreams. And that'll bring to remembrance to the butler about what happened to him and it's exactly what took place. I want to take you, if I may, to chapter, to verse number 12. And there was a young He's remembering here, we find the butler remembering because somebody and nobody can interpret Pharaoh's dreams and it's driving Pharaoh crazy. And all of a sudden the butler remembers and he starts to speak in verse number 12. And there was a young Hebrew man that was with me there, servants of the captain of the guard. I wish I could have circled these words, servants of the captain of the guard. I don't know if you guys in the back room can underline that. Did you, did you get this? This is not just Joseph a guy, but he is a servant of the captain of the guard. Notice it, circle it in your Bible. What does that mean? He is now promoted in this position. Now, you don't get promotions if you have a bad attitude. People don't give you favor and take care of you and put you in that place. This guy is getting everywhere he goes in this depressed economy that he's living in, in this horrible condition because of his attitude God exalts him and he has favor with people and gets greater jobs and greater promotions all the time. Some of us need to change our attitude. Yes, people have let us down. Yes, people have forgotten what you've done. Yes, people have said, made promises to you that never came through. But God's got a different way to get the blessings to you. And we gotta keep a hold of that with that attitude because it's the attitude that knows that my God's in control. Yesterday, Debbie and I came out of a restaurant. I said to her, Debbie, I said, Debbie, listen to me. 
I just got to tell you something. There's something exciting on the inside of me. She said, what is it? I said, doesn't matter what I do. God's going to take care of us. He'll provide. If I make a mistake, he'll, he'll cover it. He, he'll open the doors that no man can close and close the doors no man can open. Wow, man. I can make mistakes and God is going to do something wonderful about it. It's exactly what he did with Joseph. And the right attitude keeps God in your situation until it's changed. Had the wrong attitude runs him out, all of a sudden you get no promised land. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Ready to go now. Part two. So here we find this taking place. Listen to this. Servant of the, uh, of the captain of the guard. And he told him and he interpreted our dreams for us to each one. He interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass just as he interpreted it to us. So it happened. He restored me to my office and he hung the other guy. And Pharaoh sent for Joseph. And they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And they shaved him and put some antiseptic on his ugly face. And, 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 and put sweet cream and underneath his arms to make him not smell so bad and they shaved whatever needed to be shaved so he could be clean. Does your Bible say that? No, but that's just my interpretation of the whole thing. They cleaned the guy up before they brought him before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have a dream and there is no one that can interpret it. Verse number 15, but I have heard it said that you can understand a dream to interpret. Now, here's here, here in this next verse is like the key to your life. Are you ready? I would have said to Pharaoh, I'm the dude. If I interpret the dream, man, let me out because I hate that place back there. I'm tired of sucking on rat's feet. <laughs> he doesn't. Watch what he says, verse number 16. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. Oh my God, did you hear that? It is not in me. In other words, this is not about me. Did you know your business is not about you? Did you know your future is not about you? It's not about what you can accomplish, what you can accomplish. It's not about how cool you are, talented or gifted you are. Did you know it had nothing to do with what you look like? It has to do with whether or not you realize God is the answer to your future. And that's the amazing part. It's not in me, but God will give Pharaoh really the interpretation, the peace that he's looking for. Oh, in other words, the answer for you and I is God. After all of this time, you can say anything you want about Joseph, he had to have a great attitude knowing through all the trials, pressures, temptations, all the stuff that was on him and all the junk he had to live through year after year, day after day, no hope it whatsoever. He had to know that his God was great. That's what makes him so special. Now the same thing God wants to do with you and the same thing God wants to do with me, it's all about attitude. Because with the right attitude, you maintain faith with a wrong attitude, it'll suck joy right out of you, which is your strength to keep on going. Is anybody listening? If you want to think about it like this, remember the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were three very important figures in the Bible, Abraham being the father of faith. He wasn't the first Jew, but he was the first Hebrew. Jews came from the land of Judah. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had... Um, an amazing relationship. Isaac was blessed and he prospered. He's the son, if you will, of Abraham. You remember the story. A lot of people don't know that there's one of the qualities that Isaac had was an amazing ability to maintain a godly attitude. When things did not go his way, when people let him down, when people robbed and stole from him, Isaac was an amazing person. I'm going to take you to Genesis, the 26th chapter, real quick. Let's go. This is a couple of generations behind, if you will, um, Joseph. And here we see in the 26th chapter a story about Isaac, which is 
fascinating to me. The Bible makes it very clear about Isaac. And it says this in the 26th chapter in verse number 12. It says, and Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Now, a lot of you don't know what he just said there. God blessed Isaac in the land. But a lot of people don't know that it was in the midst of a famine. A famine means this, no water, no crops, no food, big poverty. The land was drying up like what we live in right now, but they didn't have systems to bring water to their facilities. It just went gone. It was gone whatsoever. They didn't have the water to water their plants. They didn't have water to do anything. The whole economic structure of the land was depressed. It's called a famine. Most of us don't understand that. In the midst of a famine, Isaac sows in the ground when it hadn't rained for a long time, and without the rain, there would never be the crops. It's like an illogical thing to do. It's like crazy. Why would you do such a thing, Isaac? It's a waste of seed. We could eat the seed. Don't you think someone told him about that? Let's eat the seed. At least we'll live for a little bit longer. But he doesn't. He takes a seed and he plants it. And God gives him for every seed a hundredfold return. Oh my goodness sakes alive. And in this land when nobody was doing anything because of the famine, here's Isaac doing it because of God. He knew that God could provide the rain. He trusted God. Now, the interesting thing about this is he prospers so much that he finds himself in a place where he's the Amalek, who is uh, uh, one who is in this land, says to Isaac, you're too rich. We both can't stay in this land. You got to get out of here. Go find your own place. You have too many sheep. You have too many workers. You have too much prosperity. You have too much that you need. You're, there's not enough in this land to provide for you and me. I was here first. Get out. Go find your own. So he starts to leave with his group of people. First thing they start to do is they start to dig wells. And I was fascinated by this, if you will, in verse number 16. And it starts to say these words in verse 16. And Amalek said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we, which means you have more people, you have more sheep, you're, you're bigger than we are, the land can't sustain you and your growth and us too. So Isaac departed. I mean, he didn't have a problem. Wouldn't you stop and think if you were bigger than the other guy and the other guy tells you to get out, that you'd say, wait a minute, I'm bigger than you, you get out. I have more men than you, you get out. I have more sheep than you, you get out. I have more power than you, you get out. What are you telling me to get out? I've been here just as long almost as you, and I'm greater than you and mightier than you, you get out. That's what every one of us would say in this place, but he doesn't. Listen to what he says, verse 17, Isaac departed. I think those are the most interesting words. I mean, when you really trust God, you just not worried about what people say. Not worried about whether a deal goes through or doesn't go through. Not worried about what your relatives say. Not worried about what people think of you or express about you. Not worried about what your relatives say. Not worried about what that ex person said in your life. When you really trust God, you just, not, no problem. If I leave, God will take care of me there. He'll find me someplace. So he leaves and he starts to do something, verse number 18. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which he had dug in the days of Abraham. Remember, that's his father, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names of his father had called them. And Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Pretty cool, huh? But the next verse, all of a sudden your effort is out of joint. It doesn't work. Things don't work out the way you had planned them to work out. Has anybody ever been something where you have put a time and effort in something and you thought it was going to come to pass a certain way and it didn't come to pass a certain way and you lost your cool before you raise your hand? This is the part everybody is there. But you the lost your cool. How many people would admit to that? And he comes along, and listen to this. He says in verse, so in verse number 19, so the, uh, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found water, found the well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gear 
quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of Isaac because they quarreled with him. And so he just gives it up. I mean, wouldn't that cause you to have a bad attitude? You were already thrown out of the original land. Then you go and put the effort in digging the well. And all of a sudden now somebody comes in and says, what you dug is mine. And remember, he's already mighty. He probably could have had a big battle here. But when you have the right attitude, God fights your battles for you. And you know it. When you don't have the right attitude, you will battle yourself. Is anybody listening? And he comes along and the herdsman, let me go to verse number 21. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called it Sitna. And he moved from there and he dug another well. This is his third well he's dug, two of which have been robbed from him. Another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he called it Rehoboth. Because he said, for now, for now, the Lord. For now, the Lord. For now, the Lord. For now, this is not about pushing those guys out. This is not about winning the battle. This is not about getting the land. This is not about feeding the sheep. This is not about water for my provision. God will take care of me. And now he comes along. He says, the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Before we quit tonight, I want to share three things for you real quick. The three names of the well says a lot. The three names of the well says a lot. The number one name, which he said is Esek. That's the one they stole first from him. He called it quarreling or fights. In other words, you and I are going to work hard at something and you're going to have to realize that people are going to fight against us to try to rob us from our position in faith in Christ Jesus. And if he gets to us, he'll rob our joy, which robs our strength. It keeps us from doing what we need to be doing. Now watch this. The second name is Sitna, which means empty deep, mutual hatred. And it's so interesting. It's mutual hatred. Mutual hatred, is, it really means this. It means that he's your enemy that you hate. So you'll find that there is a quarrel from the enemy that you could absolutely hate that is mutual. In other words, you have justification for being bummed out. But the third name is interesting. The third name means spaciousness. In other words, what, listen to me, what he was looking for was land, prosperity, water, and grazing land for his sheep. And he needed spaciousness, not just the water. He needed to have a land of his own. So he had an person who quarrels with him, that had mutual hate for each other, they had a reason to justify their attitude, but he didn't. He kept on digging the well until God came through. And you know what that really means, spaciousness? It really means this, final success. In other words, there'll be people who will fight with you, They'll be enemies, they'll hate your guts, they'll rob from you, they'll take from you, they'll defeat your effort, but it doesn't matter, God's behind you, and the thing is final success. And the attitude here is you've got to main, listen to me now, you've got to maintain a godly attitude. The outcome isn't what you do, the outcome is what he does. And that's what this is all about, is attitude. There is no reason for you to be down, depressed, discouraged, and frustrated. You may, you may be down, you may be broke, you may be here tonight just looking for something, you may be here frustrated about life in itself, you may be here just reaching out to God, well, you're in the right place. Tonight, God wants to change your attitude to the joy of the Lord, which will build the strength, that builds the confidence so you can trust him, have faith, and there's no other way to please God but by faith. And he that comes to God must believe that he is God 
and he's a rewarder, I love that word, of those who diligently, not just seek him, but diligently seek him. And the way to diligently seek God is you're gonna have to have that kind of an attitude that says, you know what, today is a great day. God's on my side. Favor has gone out before me. Mercy and grace, they follow me all the days of my life. God opens doors that no man can open. Closes doors no man can close. Can I tell you something today, God? I just want to tell you that you get great joy out of the prosperity of your servant. Well, that's what, I'm your servant. And I thank you, God, that you make all things possible. Nothing is impossible to him that believes. God, I don't know how. I don't know how. I don't know why. I don't know when. But I know it's coming. God, I know it's coming. God, I know it's coming. God, I know it's coming. You're a great and mighty God. I don't need a man. I don't need money. I don't need anything. But I got you, God, a great and mighty God. And today, I stand firm in the joy of the Lord because I have the glory of God on my side. He takes care of me at every turn of the road. And everything I touch shall be prosperous. You cannot do that unless you have the right attitude, which means that some of you are gonna have to believe that a God inside of you is greater than the problems on the outside. And when God gets bigger on the inside than your problems on the outside, you're like a balloon that just expands. Come on, somebody, give the Lord a great big praise. Every day, we need to fight for a good attitude. Get out of bed and tell the devil where to go. Tell the devil who you're gonna serve. No matter what comes at you, and no matter who fills up your wells, not gonna bother you. No matter who robs your wells, not gonna bother you. No matter who kicks you out of your own land, not gonna bother you. Doesn't matter if you're in jail, prison, can't go anywhere. God's gonna deliver you and make you the prime minister over all of the wealth that you believe God for. God wants to do a great mighty thing. And the reason for that is because he loves you very, very much. He loved you so much he went to the cross and miserably died for you. There's no devil in hell ever gone to a cross for you. He just wants to interrupt your life and cause you to be defeated. Down, out, be grumbling, discouraging, frustrated. He wants you to be the world's greatest sour puss so you never win anything and you never get anything. And your excuses, you have plenty of them, just like these men had excuses. But you're not gonna put up with it. You're gonna be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed come and blessed go. Everything you put your hand to, you shall prosper. Come on, somebody. And it starts with a right attitude. Things are tough, who cares? My God's tougher than the things that are tough. Things are bad, my God's greater than that which is bad. Things are broke, who cares? God's got all the wealth I need. And I've never seen his righteous out begging bread. God will take care of you, meet your needs. You can fall off four story building, my friends. You're gonna land on your feet with God. The rest of the world's gonna flop and die, but you're gonna land on your feet because you got God on your side and he loves you and cares about you that much. Now listen, grandpa's telling you the truth. If you believe it, give the Lord a great big shout. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Isn't God good? Some of you need to get right with God tonight. I'm just gonna do this real quick because we're getting out of here, but I want you to listen to me. You came in this place and you're not right with God. You're a stinking rotten sinner. And you're gonna die and go to hell if you don't get right with God. Tonight is your night of salvation. You say, what do you mean get right with God? That means you're gonna have to give God all of your life. That means what Jesus said, the only way to get to heaven, he says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way. You can't get there my way. We can't get there your way. The only way you're gonna to get to heaven is Jesus' way. And the only way you get to heaven, Jesus says in John third chapter, you must be born again. Now, most people in American churches don't like the word born again. It's becoming like, you know, don't wanna talk about that. We wanna just talk around it. But Jesus said it, go ahead and talk around it all you want. I'm gonna talk about it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, 
and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You don't need somebody to play games with you. You don't need somebody to kind of hype you, pitch you. You need someone to tell you the truth. If you don't get right with God, listen to me, I don't want this, neither does Jesus. That's why I went to the cross. You're gonna die and you're gonna go to hell. You can say to me all you want, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. That doesn't make it go away. Because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it magically go away. It's a real thing. Jesus talked about it himself. It's all through the Bible. You're going to die and go someplace separated from God and you're going to be miserable for eternity or you can live with God in eternity blessed. And what it's going to take is you giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. Because that's what born again means from the end, beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what God's after. A commitment from you to give God all of your heart and all of your life. No wonder things haven't gone well. You're compromised. You're a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church. Wait a minute, compromise means you're lukewarm. And Jesus spoke about that in the book of Revelation. He says, if you're lukewarm, when I come back, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know what that means? He's gonna spit you out. You don't get to go to heaven when you're spit out. That means you didn't make it. Who didn't make it? There were people that called themselves Christians that were half in Jesus and half in the world. And it's time to make a wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ. That's what you got to do. Now look at here's how it's going to happen. You're going to have to get out of your seat and you're going to have to grab a hold of your coat purse Bible friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat, get in the aisle and say, listen, I'm, I'm tired of messing around. I'm going for God. And in this house tonight, I want to get into the place like Joseph. I want to get into the place like Isaac. I want to get in the place like all the other saints of God where the blessings of the Lord, I want to live on life. Listen, you've got one life to live here. You might as well live it blessed. And what it's going to take, it's going to take all of your heart and all of your life. And he won't rob it from you. You know, he could hit you in the head with a two by four and you'd give it to him. He gives you a free will choice. I'm a free will, make the statement, I'm going for you, God, giving you all my heart, giving you all my life. And here's what I say. I say there's 15 of you in here tonight that need to give, this. listen, if I can hear God's voice to teach the word of God, I can hear God's voice on how many people need to get saved in here tonight. 15 of you. You need to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible right now. Get up out of your seat and have the boldness if Jesus had boldness, he went to the cross for you and died. And have the boldness in a safe and friendly place like this church. You get out of your seat and you come. Stand right here in front. We'll pray with you. You say, oh, that's scary. Yep, it is. Don't you think Jesus went to that cross? That was a frightening moment. First time ever separated from the Father when he took on your sins and my sins. Oh, Father, let this pass from me if it be thy will. First time he'd ever been separated from the Father when he took on your sins and my sins. Never felt that experience before. That was a whole lot worse than the lashes. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You can stay in your seat tonight or you can get up and get here. Come on, right now. Just stand up and let's go. I love you enough not to play games with you. If you don't come, it's your call. Not mine. I did my job. But tonight, it is your call. Stand up and come. Come on. You want to get right with God? You want to get saved? It's going to take a bold statement. You know why? Because you've been bold in your past with your own personal life. Now you need to get bold with God. And you come. You come. Come on. Don't ask your friend if you need to come. Just come. If they come, friend, you need to come with them. Make him feel comfortable. You just come. Fourteen more. No, no, don't clap me. Fourteen more. 
13 more. Come on. Thanks, guys. There's 13 more of you need to come. I'm not going to give you all night. It's your call. Did you know in the book of Revelation, the first thing that Jesus says about who will not get into the heavens with him is cowards. First one, cowards. Because you're afraid to move for God. They don't make it. Come on. Just give the Holy Spirit a little bit of time, guys. You know, I'm not asking you to close your eyes, bow your head. I'm asking you to make a bold statement tonight. It's your night with Jesus. There's 13 more of you now. There's 14, 13, 12 more of you. There's 11 more of you. I don't know if all 11 of you will come. It's not my issue. My issue is just to tell it like it is. There's 11 more of you that need to get up and come. There's a lot of you, in other words. Just need to come. Make that wholehearted commitment to Jesus. 10, nine more of you. Thanks for coming, guys. Nine more of you. going to go for Jesus for the rest of your life. You're going to give him all of your heart. Give him all of your life. Will you be embarrassed standing up and coming up here? Yep. No doubt about it. But that's the kind of commitment it's going to take. All of your heart and all of your life. Eight more of you. Thank you for coming. Eight more, just eight of you now. Some of you are so amazing. You know you need to come. You know it, you can feel it. And you're like so resisting this. Like, this is a game? This is not a game. This is a real tug on you right now, the Holy Spirit. And you're saying, no, I'm not going, I'm not going. Stop doing things your way and start doing things God's way. You'll never make it with God until you get that inside of you. And it starts by you getting out of your seat and coming up here. Because I'm going to shut this down and you're going to miss out. Eight of you. It's your call. I'm going to give you just a few seconds more. Because I love you enough to fight for your soul. That's why I'm doing this right now. You know, if more preachers fought for souls in their churches, we'd have better churches. So you can get as ugly with me as you want to because there's something fighting against me right now and it's working overtime to keep you from this line up here in front. I should at least fight for you when something's fighting against you and you know it. Are you gonna bow your knee to what's fighting against you? Or are you gonna say no more and get after God? Your call. Seven more. Are you? Who are you listening to? The Bible says nobody comes to the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's not a man prompting you right now. It's the Holy Spirit prompting you. Six more, five more. There's five more of you, five of you. Boy, you're stubborn. You are. I know this, I would have run to the front and dropped on my knees if I had to. Five of you, little stinkers. Cut the bowl and get up here. You know who you are. You haven't given God all your heart. Oh, you know him in your head. 
You celebrate Christmas and Easter, but you haven't given him all of your heart and you haven't given him all of your life and you know it. You even call yourself a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. Five more and I've got to shut it down. If you don't come, I can't help you. Thank you. There's four more. There's three more. I'm fighting for souls right now. You know when you go fishing, anybody a fisherman in here? You don't throw in one time and quit. You go over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Man, I'm a great fisherman because I keep going. So I've got like three more people. So do you, just, could you just slap your neighbor and tell him, let's go? <laughs> There's three more. I'm just going to keep you just a minute more. I want souls so bad. I don't want to lose you tonight. Three more. You need to come, 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 come. Three more. Just stand up. Hurry, stand up. Ah, there's three more. What do you think, guys? You think we ought to say thank you, Jesus? You got good. Okay, all of you in front, I want you to do me a favor. Look over here. This is the guy waving at you. Come on, let's stand up and give the Lord a great big praise. See this guy waving at you guys in front? His name is, hold on, hold on. His name is Pastor Joel. He's a really cool guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to pray with you and, and give you some free information. Because now you're a Christian tonight. You want to know what God wants for you tomorrow. I mean, like, now what? You know what I mean? Now that I'm a Christian, what does God expect from me? That's a good answer, right? He'll pray with you, give you that stuff, and he'll tell you about a real quick program we have to help keep you strong. And we want you to know we love you very much. It took courage for you to come forward. Don't ever think that this is just something you did. God drew you home tonight. God brought you home tonight. You didn't do it, God brought you. you tonight, tonight you're gonna belong to the Lord. I, he's gonna take you right over there and pray with you. It only takes a few moments. You, people you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.